Welcome everybody to Charity Radio, Dave Marr is my name. I'm here for the next hour from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, as I am every Wednesday night. I hope everybody's keeping well. So delighted to have in studio this evening, uh, Marie Kinsella. So Marie is currently involved in the Sacred Space Meditation. This is a monthly meetup. It's a meditation group based in Ranala, in the yoga studios in Ranala. Um, she has also her yoga teacher training course that she completed in Indonesia a number of years ago. In addition to this, she's also level one Reiki, so multi-talented. She's very involved in health and well-being. Um, so without further ado, we'll welcome Marie to the studio. So how are you this evening, Marie? Hi, Dave. Thank you. You're keeping well? I'm well, thank you. Yeah. So we might get cracking from the very, very start, Marie. The word spirituality, I suppose, is bandied about a lot and it's a very broad term. So, But let's use it anyway for the purpose of this interview, right? So how did you get into to all things spiritual, specifically yoga, and when did it all begin? Yeah, for me, I think it began very much with yoga back when I was studying in Trinity. Um, someone in my class suggested that we go to a yoga class that was being run um, by a lady who I'd say was in her 70s at the time. And um, immediately I was very taken by it um, and would have continued practicing yoga uh, since that time. Um, I would say that um, how I became interested in meditation kind of grew out of my, um, my yoga discipline. Um, during my years working as a child protection social worker, I would have practiced yoga every Tuesday night without fail in a, in a little community hall up uh, near where I was living, where, near where my parents live. And um, it was through that that I kind of became uh, familiar with the idea of um, Ujjavi breathing or kind of deep uh, breathing. Um, and it really sustained me through a very difficult number of years where I was working in a very challenging work environment where um, the hours were long and uh, it was emotionally taxing. Um, and there was times when I was very, very stressed and it was that breathing that really grounded me and helped me, um, I suppose, uh, to keep me grounded or to, to stop uh, my stress levels from spiralling um, out of control. So that was where it kind of came from for me, the, the interest in, in breathing and how the breath can uh, really sustain you uh, when you're under pressure, pressure, I suppose, in different situations. Okay, absolutely, yeah, great. And I suppose if you're under pressure, pressure or a bit of stress, it's kind of shallow breathing would be the, the natural thing to happen, right? Yeah, I think so. And I think, um, you know, I suppose back then when I think back to those times when I was under pressure, when I was under pressure with different clients, uh, with the courts, with the, there was a lot going on. And I think that um, day to day there was probably too many demands on me and I couldn't really cope with the level of demand. Um, and from that point of view, I think that when I think back to that time, there was times that that, that one night of the week was kind of my, um, it was almost like the sacred night in my life because it was that it, it kept me, it really kept me balanced. And it really, um, when I think back to it, it really was my savior. Mm. When I think back on those times, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a very useful tool to have and it's something we can use throughout our life and fall back on, isn't it? And it, not too dissimilar to yourself. I found, med well, found meditation, in inverted commas, from, you know, being in a similar situation with high levels of stress, you know, a lot of uh, anxiety, I suppose, maybe might be the word, worrying about things. And I found it a very useful for in that particular moment of my life and you know consistently anytime that i was in trouble i could fall back on mm. what i learned from that meditation group um okay so it was breathing meditation you focused on first marie that's well i think it was the breath through kind of yoga practice because in yoga you're engaged in some very challenging uh, poses and in those you need to learn to breathe through them um otherwise you won't be able to sustain them so i think that was my starting point and then after that yeah, my interest then in, in the breath kind of developed over time um, through different avenues really uh, through my when, when I changed jobs into a more health based social work role um, I began running um, stress and well-being programs with a colleague and I was I had no option but to learn you know I, I, I had to go about teaching other people how to use their breath uh, to, to help them in, in, in respect of stress um, and that's where I really did a lot of reading and then I forced myself into kind of saying, okay, I need to know more about this. I need to actually start practicing this and um, would have then went down to Zakshin Bara down in, in West Cork um, and have been down there quite a number of times now and really have found that um, 
you know, introducing a, a practice, a regular meditation practice that really benefited me um, and, and hence my, you know, continued interest in meditation. Uh, okay, plenty to go out there, Marie. Just to kind of back, backtrack slightly as well, when, when you're doing the, when you're teaching, if you, if you like, the, med or the meditation or yoga or breathing practice in, in a social work setting, I suppose it's very useful, obviously, to, to know that you, you've, you've done it yourself and you know what it's all about, so it probably makes it easier then to, to relay the information onto people. Uh, Zajim Berry, obviously a beautiful place in West Cork, mm -hmm. And yeah. um, well known for Buddhism and meditation. Do you want to talk to me a bit about that, Marie? You've, you've been to a couple of tr retreats down there. Yeah, I have, and I, I would have went originally with a friend to um, to an introduction to uh, meditation, and really was very taken by the setting. I had actually visited there um, just in passing at one stage before ever actually going there, and was was bowled over and really um, taken by the, the the scene because it's. Um, at the edge of a cliff and overlooking this vast sea with the beautiful meditation room overlooking the sea and I was just very taken with it and was determined to go back and, and after that went back a number of times and have completed a number of different courses there um, and I think it's both the setting and the practice of meditation there combined that that makes it a very special place um, and I think for me it's that um, it's, it's that uh, taking that time to pause and to really um, you know, take time out from the busyness of life and uh, the the non-stop nature of night life um, nowadays. That that uh, that's where I find the the appeal in meditation. Mm. And I suppose coupled with the fact then that it's this unbelievably scenic um, part of Ireland where you know spectacular views and I've been there myself I know exactly that the kind of vista you're talking about it's stunning. Is that because um, you're from Cork? <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely yeah <laughs> and just in terms of it's obviously a Buddhist centre as well just, just for the purposes of the, the listener benefits of the listeners um, is there a huge amount of Buddhism? Is it? Does that come across in the, the teachings? While it's a Buddhist setting, I think it's very much um, open to anybody and everyone. Um, they have a very inclusive um, type of arrangement there, you know. So they want local people to come in. They want people to come from here, uh, far and uh, near, to avail of the facilities of the center. And they're they're building their own Buddhist temple there, but it's it's. You know, for people who might not have any interest in the Buddhist aspect, it's it's not in your face. You know, for people who aren't interested in it, that's fine too. You can just go. It's, it's it can be just a space to find a peaceful place, and they have a spiritual care center there as well. So their focus is more, I think, on minding the person rather than it being focused in any particular religion. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think yeah. I mean, I know the first time I went to to a, a retreat, it can be a little bit overwhelming if you're not used to the kind of religious aspect. But like you said, it's not thrown in your face. It's part of it, yes, but it's not the whole aspect of it, really. You know. Yeah. Um, okay, fantastic. And then you yoga training uh, teacher t teacher training course in Indonesia, Marie. Do you want to tell us a bit about that and how that came about? Yeah. Well, I think because I loved yoga so much, it was always, I suppose, my passion. I decided I'd. I do the yoga teacher training thinking that that could be the next career move for me. Um, I went for a month to Bali in Indonesia and did a, an Ashtanga yoga teacher training course there. Um, and I think I really enjoyed the experience. I enjoyed the um, learning, I, the, the learning that was involved in it. And the, the two teachers who were there were, uh, were two Indian gentlemen who were exceptionally good. and. Um, they were just so thorough. They were just excellent at what they did. They were just, yeah, they were, they were in a league of their own, really. Um, and when I came back, I, I decided I'd do some classes. But what surprised me most was that I didn't enjoy the teaching, um, the, yoga te uh -huh. the yoga teaching. After all that, I was, um, yeah, I was pretty surprised that I, I just felt that there was very little, you know, while you'd do the class you got I got very little back from it and it wasn't okay. what I expected so and it wasn't what I wanted so I enjoyed I probably did maybe four or five classes and I decided it wasn't for me it was um, it was just not my cup of tea I prefer something more probably interactive where I have some feedback or you know there's some feedback loop whereas I could have been instructing people to do all these different poses and and had no idea whether they enjoyed it whether you know people just get up say they enjoyed it and leave whereas I really didn't have that sense as to whether I was good at it or not and uh, I just didn't feel it was my 
my okay. thing after all that. But still love participating, obviously, but not necessarily yeah. teaching. Yeah, yeah, it just wasn't. I, I think, yeah, then I then I decided after that that no, that, that doing yoga was probably more of my interest rather than giving classes in it, you know, and I'd, I could probably appreciate more the level of skill involved in delivering a good yoga class because, you know, I've been to hundreds of yoga classes over the years and some are a lot better than others and it may mm. be, yeah, I, I suppose I developed a real appreciation for, you know, the, the exceptionally good yoga teachers and how much effort and preparation and thought and practice goes in to the classes for them. Okay, excellent, yeah. And just in terms of the breeding, Marie, this is obviously a, f a focal point for yourself. How important, like I, I've kind of flirted with the idea of yoga from time to time and gone to a few classes, but never really got into it, very much into meditation, but not necessarily yoga. Uh, and how important is the, the breeding in yoga? Do you want to tell us about the importance of that? Yeah, I think it's absolutely probably the key, you know, it really is the key to, to good yoga practice, because if you're not breathing and you're getting into these technically quite difficult postures, you're very unlikely to be able to sustain them. And I think yoga is supposed to kind of mirror life, really, that like we'll all find ourselves in different situations. And, you know, it's that thing that you mentioned about like breathing in a shallow way, yeah. or oftentimes I'd say in stressful situations, we may kind of hold our breath, you know, you're just going to hold it without breathing. And I think it's similar that oftentimes in yoga, I'd catch myself and I'd be saying, oh, this does mirror life. You know, you catch yourself in the moment and you say, I need to breathe through this. And, you know, it would be those postures where your arms are shaking, your legs are shaking, you're twisted around in a circle and your arms are all up in the air or under, you know, that you're bent in this, these funny, strange, um, strained uh, ways. And it, it is about breathing through that and trying to sometimes, you know, it's about listening to your body and, and saying, OK, should I keep going or should I stop? But that part is key. And if you're not breathing, you're not going to know when it's time to stop the posture or when it's you know when you're okay to keep going and yeah. if it's just the, the the kind of breathing yourself through it perfect and i suppose over time then you get kind of more perceptive about your own body and about your own breathing methods and what works and what doesn't work and how much you can kind of push your body and when to relax you become yeah. more intuitive really as well yeah i think so and i think it's that piece around you know when you're certainly in yoga you're moving in a lot of different ways and it's that piece around if you're twisted in a certain direction and your lungs are kind of being wrong, you know, they're being squeezed in different ways, you're getting air into places that's probably never reached them before and it's that part of it that, you know, you nearly feel the oxygen flooding down into your organs, that's how it feels when you're in the middle of those poses and it's very, you know, while you're in it you might be kind of in a bit of a panic but when you come out of it your body just feels like it's been flushed with, I don't know, some type of, I mean when you finish the class you just come out your your Endorphins yeah, flowing. I wouldn't even think so. I, I don't know what it is, but it's 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 like it's like the air has got to places it never got to before, and and it's refreshing everything. That's that's how it feels to me, anyway. A very very vivid picture. What about the male listeners who may be listening in tonight and said, you know what, not a million years would you catch me in the yoga studio? How are you going to well, entice them into it? <laughs> well, I'm not here to, I suppose, to entice <laughs> anyone in, but I I, I know that um, my uncle Tommy had been doing uh, yoga classes down in in a Thai. And I was really surprised when he'd said it to me, but very impressed. And, and I did do a few um, classes with my dad in, in his house at one stage too, just to, you know, to give him a flavour of it. And I, I think it's, I think as with everything, it's worth trying something at least once to see, you know, it may not be for everyone, but I think, you know, flexibility and, and you know, being supple is really important. And I know that that lady uh, who taught me in Trinity all those years ago, I remember, I'm pretty sure her name was Renee, she was, I would say, in her 70s at that time, and she, her, her catchphrase was, you're as young as your spine. And, you know, and at the time, I couldn't, I couldn't even nearly reach the floor. I couldn't even nearly reach my toes. I'd say I had a, at least a full hand between my, uh, you know, a full hand, the gap between where I needed to get to, to touch the floor. And within a very short space of time, I was able to fully put my two palms on the floor. And it was that part around, you know, the, the importance of, flexibility and being able to to I suppose keep your body as flexible and as young not as young but as supple as, as possible to benefit it exactly and more, more important obviously uh, as people get older I suppose they you know naturally stiffen up a bit so becoming you know trying to get a bit of flexibility is, is more important than, than ever I'd imagine yeah and I think it's you know I see even my own mum attends the League of Health which is again it's a model of it, to me it sounds like yoga it's stretching and it's moving and I think you know, I think that's what it's all about. It's about moving our bodies and keeping ourselves well and, and 
you know, going. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, okay, so let, let's move on. So, Marie, onto the sacred space meditation. You run this once a month. Now, we'll um, confess here to our listeners that myself and Marie do know each other, in fact, and we'll be getting married <laughs> uh, right. Feb- February of next year, for us, so 1st of February. So I do have a little bit of inside track here, uh, admittedly. So do you want to tell us about that, Marie? Once a month, every Saturday. I am an attendee, so I do know right. all about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll also confess that um, uh, when, I suppose, when the, this meditation group started, it was actually Dave who ran it. Um, I have taken over and you brought it to, it. A new, to a new <laughs> level, Marie. Um, and um, the idea behind it is to give people the opportunity to meditate in a very beautiful space. Um, we're extremely lucky that uh, the owner of, um, of Yoga Dublin has allowed us to use that space in Ranala. And um, to me, you couldn't get a nicer spot to, to meditate in, in Dublin. Um, and it's that part around having that time out from life. Uh, for me, I certainly find the weeks very, very busy. Monday to Friday are exceptionally busy. Um, and it's, it's nice to have that time just with a few people. We keep the numbers small. Um, and, um, you know, the most recent one, I'd say there was seven of us in total. Mm. Um, and it's just a really nice uh, space. And, you know, the last one that we did was just, I, I just thought it was really beautiful because the rain was pelleting down on the roof above us and the light had faded and it was becoming dark and uh, yeah it was just really really nice um, I think I think what you, you said that after the after meditation group to one of the people in there I think she thought you were mad you were like it's beautiful the rain hitting against the but I know what you mean that kind of cozy warm well, it's feeling that feeling yeah. of being inside and being kind of you know meditating safe and space kind of yeah, thing, yeah. You're, you know and I, I suppose for any listeners who don't know meditation is just breathing and I think that's what it comes down to. I think people confuse it sometimes. You know, I think there's been a lot of confusion maybe around what exactly meditation is. But I mean, that's really when, it, when you peel it back, it's about uh, breathing and bringing your attention back to the breath. Um, and I and think kind of accepting what comes up as well. You know, I think a lot of people, their fear about meditation is they may have kind of done it once or twice and say, you know, what, I can't do it. I can't sit with my thoughts. And that really is the kind of challenge just to sit and let the thoughts flow not necessarily, a high, you know, attach on to the thoughts, but let them flow. Yeah. Um, but I think, I mean, I obviously have probably a bit of a bias here, but I think the, what you do really well in, in the meditation group, Marie, is you do a massive amount of research. And I think I've been guilty of the past, uh, in the past of maybe winging it slightly and just going on. But, you know, you give her, you've clearly done a lot of research on it in terms of the, the kind of anatomy and the, the whole science behind breeding and the importance of it. And it's very well received by the people who come along. Mm. Um, it just shows, yeah, and it kind of makes more sense. You had charts and everything the last day and sheets to give out to people and they were, you know, genuinely taken aback. I think it's that thing around when you go off by yourself, you can be left going, oh, am I doing this right? What do, what exactly do I do? And I think that's why um, for me it is about trying to give people pointers or, you know, even the meditation retreats I've done down in Zakshin Barra, they've given us tips on different apps to use and um, you know, even different um, different gurus per se who who are kind of meditation oriented, and I think that's really helpful because it it you know it can just lead you down new paths and you get new ideas from different people, and I think that's always really welcome because you're at risk of doing the same thing over and over mm-hmm. again. So certainly for me, it is about you know trying to expand my knowledge and expand my awareness of um, of of meditation and how to do things differently or better or you know or look at new ways of delivering um delivering kind of meditation groups to people so mm. that they feel that they come away with tools themselves that they can use particularly by themselves because obviously once a month isn't going to make a huge impact on someone um but hopefully if they leave saying oh i'm going to try that myself or i'm going to google that or i'm going to youtube that or you know, look at this app or, you know, that they come away and they might do, even if they do it once a week, at least it's more than they might have been doing already. Um, you know. And I the accessibility of it, you're breaking it down and saying, look, it's, it's very straightforward. It's not rocket science. It's not complex. The challenge really is kind of sitting down, making the time first and foremost, and then kind of sitting with the uncomfortableness, if you like, of, of thoughts flowing into your head that might f- make you feel a bit uneasy and just kind of sitting and accepting these thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I think for most people, I mean, people are flooded with thoughts in their days. And I think that's, you know, the kind of key is that when you kind of um, not stop the thoughts, but you kind of just 
you know, you say, actually, I'm going to just pause here and let them come, come mm. in, flow in, flow out, and not get too, um, I suppose, caught sidetracked by them or caught yeah. up in them. Yeah, that, that. And I think it's almost like a kind of a window in your life anyway, you know, like if, if you can bring that level of acceptance, and it's probably something I struggle with a lot myself, just n not kind of accepting things the way they are and doing nothing about it, but accepting this is the way it is. And yes, put things in place to change if you want aspects of your life changed, absolutely. <laughs> but just not accepting the way things are as opposed yeah, to just yeah. beating yourself up about things. Yeah, that's it. I think it's a, yeah, certainly a, I, I think, you know, there's an analogy that they use within the Buddhist circles. I think it's where they, it stems from around you know, muddy water. If you keep stirring it, will keep, it will stay muddy. But if you, you know, if you let it settle and sink the mud will fall to the bottom of the glass and I think for me that was a really key learning because it really made sense to me that you know when you still that water how things become clearer and I think in meditation that's kind of key for me it's that piece around having the ability to respond instead of react because you're slowing everything down you're, you're starting to see things more clearly and I think that's part of it so it's not just about breathing it's also about slowing everything and and looking at our reactions and looking at how we are being in life so it's a, it's a it's a broader piece too it is and i think you become more intelligent in your reactions and again this is something personally i would kind of struggle with being overreactive or reacting too quickly and i know when i'm a good when i'm in a good space in terms of meditation i'm less reactive um, and you make yeah. better decisions it's as simple yeah. as that i agree with you and i think that i've said to you before around how my days always flow a lot better the days i meditate um, my days just go a lot better. They're always just, you know, from the smallest things to the biggest things. I just feel that they are smoother. You know, life is smoother, and I think that's what keeps me doing it because it's um, it's like that tapping into our own natural flow, and I think that's what it does for me. You know. Mm, absolutely. Is your uh, has your routine been interrupted this week by a certain cat in the house? Yes. Or apartment, right? <laughs> yes. Our our kitten sitting. We're. Uh, kitten sitting sky who i realized today has been aptly named because she sits on the sky box which uh, <laughs> i didn't realize but yes for the, uh, from the, 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 she's drawn to the heat right yeah yes but yes meditation has absolutely been interrupted by sky who spends all her time meowing and I'm trying to <laughs> trying to meditate <laughs> but she's very endearing uh, unbelievable <laughs> character yeah yeah um, great, yeah, but I suppose there's, a, there's a something relaxing about a cat kind of sitting on you as well. So yeah, maybe, well, I think maybe this meditation, that in itself, exactly. the stroking and her purring, it's, you know, that you can look at you're, it. You're fairly it. present. Yeah, absolutely. You kind of have to be, you know, the, the, the attention is demanded of you to sit and stroke her, which is nice, you know, so this meditation within that, I think, too. Yeah. Good stuff. OK, so I think that's a, an opportune time to take a break anyway. And when we come back, we might kind of dive into to the Reiki and all, all that. Uh, race. OK, OK, I hope everybody's enjoying this as much as I am. Um, so we're going to take a quick ad and we'll be back in a couple of minutes. So stay tuned, folks. Great. Happy days. Um, Hello, Mr. Dave. Perfect. All good. Um, Cool, okay, so do you want to go on about the, the Reiki? Do you want to yeah, so maybe mention it, but yeah, mention, it's okay. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, perfect, so we might start talking about the Reiki, do if you wanted to yeah, bring okay. in then anything, you know, sea yeah. swimming or oh, yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah, we'll have away now, sure, we have plenty of time. Um, great, that's, that's flowing that's extremely well. That's fine. Yeah, absolutely, great stuff, right? Welcome everybody to Charlie Radio. Dave Marr here every Wednesday from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Uh, so delighted to have in the studio this evening Marie Kinsella. So Marie is currently running Sacred Space Meditation. It's based in Ranala. It's a yoga studio in Ranala. So really just having a, a lovely conversation here about anything meditation related, the benefits of it, how Marie got into it. Um, she first uh, came across yoga actually and then did a lot of breathing exercises in yoga and then went on to meditation from there. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of pick it up from there, Marie. You were kind of, we kind of touched before before, touched on the, the, the Reiki aspect before the break. So it might be a, a good place to, to pick it up again. Yeah, so um, in terms of Reiki, how I became interested in Reiki was um, my auntie's um, uh, flatmate, per se, or her housemate, um, Maura, um, does Reiki down in Limerick. And um, she very generously um, brought me to um, the space where she does her Reiki and homeopathy. and. Uh, did Reiki on me and I was really taken by it like I really it was probably yeah it was one time in my life where I was like oh I really understand this without really knowing what it was all about 
um, and it's about a kind of energy, you know, and I really, uh, yeah, I was really interested in it and was really keen to kind of learn more about it. And she'd given me a book which I read um, and it really sparked my interest in, in learning more about it. And then coincidentally, a colleague of mine um, who's, a, who's a nurse uh, had mentioned too that she was interested in it. So we did it together. We did a Reiki, the Reiki level one course together. Um, and yeah, it was something I really have benefited from, uh, have considered continuing on with because I, I still really enjoy it. Mm. Um, I do it on myself. I did it on the cat this week at one point. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I often just in, in different spaces just go, oh, I must do Reiki now. You know, it just comes up every now and again. And I, it's something I can feel I can tap into very easily, which I like. Again, so, another yeah. useful tool to have. And I suppose for, for the benefits of the listeners, and I know me included, Reiki is something I've heard about a lot, but I probably couldn't put a definition on it. So do you want to kind of sum up what it is, basically, or what's involved? Yeah, I think it's... Um, I think our own body has a very natural ability to heal itself. You know, if we get a cut, if, we, if there's something wrong with us, the body, you know, it, it's like there's a natural ability in all of us to kind of heal uh, it's not um something we need to tell our body to do it's not it's just there it's, it's something that's within all of us and i think when i think of reiki um, that really springs to mind it's like reiki isn't bringing the healing abilities it's it's kind of a you know people say oh it's like healing energy but i wouldn't see it that way i think the body is already there but it's it's kind of nearly encouraging that along you know so you're kind of tapping into um, the energy of the body and uh, really kind of bringing focus to that. Um, okay. So that's that would be my view. And it was interesting even doing the Reiki training at the time. I had, uh, as you know, uh, uh, broken some bones in my foot, and uh, without even saying it to one of the girls who was practicing the Reiki on me, she immediately was saying to me, "My gosh, your your right foot is so hot." And it was true. Like it was, I could feel it myself when she was doing it on me that the level of heat. Uh, in that foot was was unbelievable and she said it to me a few she was like I can't get over how hot your foot has become and it was amazing so it was in the exact spot where the where the problems had had arisen in terms of the the the, the breaks of the bones so yeah it was very interesting to me that that was um that was the case you know yeah. so it, it really ties in with uh the body's natural abilities I suppose okay so you reckon in, in like an injured area will be much hotter, for lack of a better word, or much more heat coming from an injured area of the well, body? Well, possibly, I don't know, maybe for, for every person, I'm sure it's different, but I know for me that that very much w was evident during the, the Reiki training. Um, and again, I think that, that that would be, you know, if I've got a headache or there's something going on for me, I try and tap into kind of the Reiki energy and, and bring myself back to that to try and um, realign with my own body's natural ability to kind of heal itself you know okay and when you say do it yourself uh, like again explain maybe to the listeners how how would you do I, I can see how a practitioner can do it on you how do you do it on yourself what's involved it's the same thing I suppose it's the use of your hands that you're trying to kind of um, it's quite hard to describe but I think it's that piece around kind of um, focusing I, I think that's really what it is what Reiki to me is it's kind of becoming intentionally focused on the area and using your hands to kind of activate the for want of a better word i suppose the the energy okay and is there a touch involved or is it hovering over yeah, the body you, there you, is you that, touch yeah. very gently you know you touch very gently the area and uh, and then there there are um, i'm not sure what uh, i can't i can't uh, remember really how you term it but there's specific kind of um uh it escapes me now the word um not chakras. Not chakras. Um, I suppose processes. I, I, can't, I can't remember the word that within Reiki they use, but um, that you just repeat it over and over again to, to kind of focus your attention there. Okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose it's one of many kind of therapies in terms of, you know, overall um, w wellness, I suppose, for lack of a better word. Um, again, because I, I am currently living with you, Marie, and I know the ins and outs, I know you're an avid sea swimmer, and that's kind of tying in with the whole wellness and, mm. uh, and you know, um, yeah, well-being and, and, and activity active, I suppose. Do you want to tell us a bit about sea swimming and how you first came across that? Yeah, well, I think I, I've digressing slightly. Well, I'm, I'm fortunate in that um, my family home is is very close by Seapoint, 
um, which is um, a beautiful swimming spot. Unfortunately, uh, this summer it has been ruined by the issues with sewage in Dublin Bay, but um, historically it's a, it's a very beautiful area. Um, and uh, one that, you know, is, is known for, um, for bathing. Um, and I think uh, for me, like I've always loved water, like from the time I was a young child, I've always just loved water. Um, I, I find I'm not really able to swim in pools anymore because the chlorine affects my uh, sinuses in particular. So sea, sea swimming has been the answer for me that I can still swim and enjoy uh, swimming, but in a, you know, in a, in a different way and in a, in a, I suppose, very natural way. And I do think that when I'm in the sea, it's so vast. I just always have found that, I don't know, maybe I was some type of mermaid in another life, but it's, it's such a, I don't know, such a freeing experience and it's something I just absolutely love um, and have done since I was, since I was very young. Um, and that's something and I, I can vouch for that as well. I mean, I obviously see sea swam intermittently for a number of years, but only recently got into it, probably last summer. And again, it's unbelievably therapeutic, I find, anyway. Yeah. I think great I think form of exercise, salt water that has therapeutic, known therapeutic effects, right? Yeah, because I think like the, it's said that the vibration of nature is perfect, and getting into nature is the way. You know, if you're in any way down, or if there's anything going on in your life, you know, the way to go about healing it, or, or you know, is to get into nature um, because of that vibration of nature being so perfect. And for me, that's the sea. I just find everything just fades away when I go, particularly under the water and I'm seeing the green of the sea mm. below me, you know, and I just think it's, yeah, I just think it's outstanding, it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have to be kind of plucky at the start, don't you, when you, you jump do. in initially, kind of, uh, maybe when we started in kind of May, May of this year, no, April, April you're right, April, April yeah. in Wicklow, and it was absolutely it's Baltic, Baltic yeah. it was about 19 or 20 degrees, <laughs> just to give the listeners a kind of context. Um, the weather was unbelievably good for, for April, 20 degrees, sun splitting the sun, so they decided to go down to Wicklow, down to British Bay, and it was perishing. Yeah, that's <laughs> true, absolutely freezing. Really difficult to get in, I yeah. think. Uh, I lasted about 30 seconds, I had to jump out. Yeah. Um, but as the kind of summer got in and the, 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 it progressed a little bit, it became, it, came, it became progressively easier anyway, but you do need to, to, to kind of bite the bullet and jump in and... Yeah, jump into you know. out of your comfort zone literally yeah i think so i think so but i think it's worth it and i think that's the the piece i think once you start sea swimming and i think i think i have a reformed uh well i don't know what the word i'd use for you but you're definitely uh someone who did like who wasn't a regular but you're definitely a regular now i think and it's you've caught the caught the bug caught the bug in terms of sea swimming yeah, yeah. For sure. and as well as that communal thing as well you know in sea point you could get on a nice summer's evening you could get sometimes you can get three or four people down there and that's beautiful too because mm. it's so so quiet mm. but more times you can get 20 30 40 and there's a great buzz around the place and people having chats and yeah, yeah. you know you see people bringing down flasks of tea and yeah, it's a social. It's a, so, you know, a social aspect to it, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, which I, is great like I, for community, right? I think so. I mean, I used to go with a friend all the time, and then she moved home to Mayo, and um, after that, I joined one of the meetup groups, the Seals, and that was great. You know, it was a great time for me in terms of just having other people to go swimming with. You know, it was it was nice. You know, as life changes and friends, you know, go about getting married or things change. You know, and I was really keen to be out swimming and meeting people, and it was a way to do both. And yeah, I just think there's so many avenues now to. To, you know, and, and for me, you know, you hear of kind of, uh, I think it was the 11 o'clock club, they call it in Seapoint, where some of the retired people go down. And I just think it's such a nice, you know, nice place to go and such a nice activity to do at any age. Um, but obviously, as you said, you have to be able for the, yeah, got, uh, the, the shock of the cold, <laughs> you know, when you, when you get in and it is freezing. But even on that, and the age thing, I went down to Grey Sons, you weren't there, actually, it was probably about two or three months ago, and there was a man, he must have been 82 or three, he told me his age, I can't remember, I found early 80s anyway, but I th up till about four or five years ago, he was even swimming in the winter, mm -hmm. has been doing it for years and years and years, and again, similar to us, the only reason why he went to Grey Sons that particular evening, be because of what was going on in, in Dublin Bay, um, but incredible just to say how, you know, I, I suppose it, it, it's known to build up your immune system, it can make mm -hmm. you more resilient. I think it's such a mental battle at times jumping in that it gives you kind of mental fortitude as well as everything else. So yeah. it's as some. Per, as per Wim Hof, my friend. As a Wim Hof, absolutely. <laughs> your obsession with Wim Hof. Tell the listeners about Wim Hof, Marie. 
Wim Hof is the ice man. He swims in ice waters, and I'm absolutely fascinated by him, as Dave knows well, because I spend all my time listening to um, clips of him, of videos of him on YouTube, of reading his book. Um, I just think he's an absolute um, fascination because he, and like that, I suppose all everything he does, he researches with different universities, and it, 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 yeah, it's the power, I suppose, of the mind as well as the body. Um, and uh, yeah, he certainly vouches for the benefits of the cold. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, yeah. So he, he's a Dutch guy who jumps into ice baths, basically, is a short, well, more short than version that, of it. You'd have, to, you'd have to look him up. He's, <laughs> he's quite incredible. He's like a superhuman. He's amazing. Yeah. He is, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, this, going back to, to kind of sea swim for a second, again, it's something I kind of found or re found relatively recently, only about the last year, year and a half. Um, I probably go from, I, I won't even say April because that was, we only kind of dipped our toe and then literally, maybe May, I kind of intended finishing the end of August, but I've continued on because it's been mild enough and the water actually, once you're used to it, is fine. So it's kind of mid-September now or a bit beyond and I'm still kind of going once or twice mm. a week, which is great. Um, I, I'll have to get a replacement therapy for, for the winter months anyway. Um, I know people brave it during the winter, but to me, that's you know, you, you'd want to be on another level now to jump in there in November, December time. But I mean, it's incredible for people to do it, and again, you, you want to be a hardy devil, as they say. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and any retreats, I mean, we're kind of going from one topic to the other here, Marie, but just in terms of kind of retreats, is something you kind of touched on earlier. Um, anything in the pipeline? I know it was kind of February time, um, yeah, with no, the, the I... one you go down to the Zashimbera. Yeah, no, well, uh, for now, because obviously we have a wedding on the horizon. The horizon, uh, yeah, yeah. We're going to be going down to... Um, and we're both working very hard at that. Yes, yes. <laughs> some, some harder than others. <laughs> um, yeah, so no, uh, there's no imminent plans to go down to Zakshinbara, but it's always, I suppose, in the back of my mind, it's a, it's a, it's a haven, you know, so, um, you know, when you need a break from the hustle and bustle of life, it's, it's nice to have the option to go on... Um, but the, you know, and the, I, I guess the idea of having, say, the likes of the sacred space meditation is to have small snippets of those spaces um, in the city because I, I think that um, they can be hard to find sometimes. Absolutely, yeah. and they talk about the kind of importance of sanghas. Sanghas mean group. I think would be the direct translation from Sanskrit, or uh, possibly. Mm. Um, but yeah, ha having that kind of little bit of kind of meditation community, if you like, and like you said, that the numbers are generally smallish, which is perfect. They might mm. be five it might be seven it might be ten so it's relatively small but a nice kind of intimate crowd nonetheless mm. yeah yeah absolutely um, and it is i mean i suppose dublin or any other city larger cities tend to be quite transient right people come and go mm. they might be living here for five you mentioned your your friend from mayo neve who was here for a number of years and then went back home mm. um and you know similar to myself i'm in dublin now 14 years and the amount of people have come and go over the years is incredible you know people get married they stay in dublin they move out they move away so it's important to kind of have, have that kind of you know space or community as well to, to to kind of keep keep in touch with people um i guess was for the listeners maria so how do they find it when is the next um session if you want to call it that when is it on next one is on the 12th uh, saturday the 12th of october okay and it's advertised to meet up um the meetup groups the sober slice meetup um yeah so and it, it's pretty much every every month every usually the second saturday of the month but it's posted on meetup a meetup okay and for those of the people who aren't familiar with meetup.com an excellent website it's it's global actually and there's hundreds of thousands of groups within meetup.com um this particular one is sober slice that i have been running for a number of years since about 2010 and i suppose the idea i I'll get a plug in for the sober slice the idea behind that was just to give an alternative to the you know maybe the drink scene out there in in, in dublin or in ireland for that fact but the, the majority of events tend to be in and around the dublin area and a lot of meditation there's a lot of meditation groups on it a lot of walking groups on it so if you're interested in coming along to sacred space we'd be delighted to have you it's as, as marie said one saturday every month go on to sober slice key and sober slice the meetup group will come up uh, click into events and you'll you'll find us there um so i suppose we're just going to wrap things up marie it's been a very very enjoyable last kind of 40 minutes and it's flowed very very easily um 
I mean, we've talked about a lot, started off obviously with the yoga, um, a lot in, in terms of breathing, went into the, the, to the meditation, Reiki, sea swimming, so plenty to go at. Any kind of parting words or, or that you'd like to, to say to the listeners out there? You know, I suppose maybe people are struggling at the moment, maybe they're under pressure, a lot of stress or anxiety, and don't know where to turn to, you know, would there be any kind of advice you'd give them? Um, I think, uh, you know, I think the main goal for everybody is to be happy and to be joyful in life and to be keeping themselves well. And I think that's the kind of key message. Um, and it's about doing it whatever way you want or whatever way works best for you. I know, you know, for me, meditation works for me. I know the friend of mine who came to the beginner's meditation course with me, my good friend Bernie down in Sakshambara, that wasn't her cup of tea. You know, she was saying that walking gives her the same feeling of, of you know relaxation so for her that worked for her and I think for everyone it's something different it doesn't necessarily have to be meditation but it's about finding those you know finding those activities that that nourish you and that kind of sustain you um, and and you know finding things that soothe you during times when you know when times are tough or things aren't going right and I think that's part of it too that we all need to have a toolbox of, of tools that will work for us um, for particularly for harder times. I mean, I think when times are good, it's important to, to be practicing them so that they are, you know, strong and working. But I think the times when we need them most are when things are going wrong, you know, when things, you know, with the, the, the unpre unpredictability and the, the up and down nature of life, I think, you know, it, it's, it's that piece around, there's no point in trying to pull them out when things are going wrong, because you won't, you know, like any skill, it has to be practiced. And I think that's the same for all of these types of skills. They need to be, um, you know, in use mm -hmm. on a regular basis. On a regular. I think, so the, I think key, the key is a routine, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's routine yeah. and it's practice and it's skill building to, like a muscle, it's, you know, everything mm. needs to, you know, be built up and, um, and it's that piece around, have you enough tools in the toolbox and are you practicing them? Yeah, that's interesting. And you actually got me a book in Dr. Harry Barry, uh, Emotional Resilience, a fantastic read altogether. I still haven't got through it finally, but I mean, there's so much you can take from it. And one thing he talks about a lot, obviously, is resilience mm. and how to build up resilience. And I suppose uh, more prevalent in modern society than it ever has been, you know, Absolutely. to find that resilience because life is tough. And if you don't have resilience, you, you, you'll struggle a lot. You know, that's just the bottom line to it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it is. I think for for everyone, these life skills aren't really the skills that are taught when we're younger. And for me, it's been about um, building them myself. And it's taken me like I spent so much time researching and looking up different things on YouTube. And you know, there's so much out there. There's so much learning to be had. And it is, you know, for me, I keep like a learning journal on an ongoing basis, and I take notes from everything. And I'm always kind of building that and looking at, you know, what what I can add to my collection of of tools and that really you know I, to your I, gigantic chart my gigantic chart <laughs> and my gigantic toolbox <laughs> exactly there you go the plan to go yeah no another point you made there is was the, the kind of tolerance or different strokes for different folks right you mentioned your friend bernie there you went down to zachi and bernie it just wasn't her cup of tea mm. walking was her cup of tea you said i had a similar experience with, with, with a mate of mine he, he just an avid reader had no interest in mindfulness and meditation and i just finished a eight week course uh, a mindfulness course in 2012 and was completely obsessed by it and thought everybody in the world should be doing mindfulness it was the only thing and this particular person had no interest was struggling in one aspect of his life and had no interest in hearing about mindfulness or meditation and i kept trying to browbeat him saying this is what you need this is what you need which is not the thing to do really yeah. you know yeah. and i suppose he found solace in reading and just being present while he was reading and that was his way of dealing with things so i suppose it is you know, once you have something really, what works yeah. for you is, is the key thing as opposed to prescribing a particular thing for somebody. Yeah, I think so. Cause, I mean, we're all human and different things will work and different things won't. It depends on our, you know, our personality. There's so many different factors at play, but, you know, I think it's that piece around people finding what works for them and, and going with that. Mm. And we do a lot of walking anyway. I mean, walking is unbelievable, you know, a proven way of improving your mental health as well. So that's a, and it, it's a way you can be present. I mean, there's mindful walking. Yeah, there is, yeah. Being present, yeah. so there you go, getting that in. Um, okay, fascinating stuff for me. Really, really appreciate your time. Um, we are going to... Uh, end on a, on a nice note. Uh, okay, beautifully nice. put, Marie. And again, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. So